Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm still Sarah, and today I've got a really cool interview for you. Back in December, I connected with Renata Rocha, who is Danilo's cousin. Danilo is another member of Midnight Oil Collective. He's the director of Salt. That's one of the really cool things about the collective is you can share your network with each other and boost each other's projects up that way. I had a really great conversation with Renata about her job as an oceanographer. Yeah, she makes maps of the ocean floor in the Netherlands. It's awesome. We talked about shipwrecks, World War II bombs, narwhals, seals, what it's like to live with the same people for an extended period of time. It was super fun and super informative, especially because one of my characters is a cartographer. So I was like, what is it actually like to live on a ship and make maps of your world? Anyway, I hope you have as much fun listening to this conversation as I did having it. And without further ado, here is that conversation with Renata. So tell me where you are right now, like in the world. I, oh, I'm just in my uh, house in the Netherlands. Right, in the Netherlands. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Do you mind just saying your name and your profession? Yes, uh, my name is Renata Rocha. I am a hydrographic surveyor. Um, yeah, and an oceanographer, but currently I work as a hydrographic surveyor. Can you just explain again, like what exactly that means and what your day-to-day -day looks like? Because your job sounds so cool and I'm starting to think I went into the wrong profession. <laughs> 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 yeah, everybody says that, but it's not uh, so uh, always that nice. Sometimes it's uh, hard, but yeah, some other times it's very fun also. <laughs> Basically, what we make, it's uh, maps of the seafloor and for different purposes and the different applications. Um, I studied oceanography and I specialized in marine geology. Yeah, I, I had kind of a scientific background like on my uh, studies, but now I work as a hydrographic surveyor, which is a very technical um yeah applied kind of job actually so i just uh, literally go out on boats and measure the seafloor or measure other properties of the seafloor and uh, later on we make uh, maps out of it or sometimes just models like 3d models or yeah sometimes we just deliver the data clouds which are like the measurements of the individual points and they can uh, also work with that later on and yeah it's very crowded in the sea nowadays so it looks like it's a little bit like distant but uh, it's actually there's a lot of work in that uh, sector it's very busy we don't stop this year we just uh, did as normal as like any other year for example and yeah there's a lot of uh, jobs and not that many people doing that so it's actually not that hard to get a job in that profession. <laughs> I'll have to keep that in mind. <laughs> I might yeah. just if you much. really, really, really want to, then you can get it. And in my company is one of the places where like the most important thing is not even the background or the studies that the person did, but just what they want to do if they want to do it. Like I have a colleague that is a car mechanic and he's one of our best surveyors in the company. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, he can just solve any like technical problems that happens with them because we use these machines and we use boats. And sometimes it's just us and the skipper on the boat. There is like not a big, uh, we are not so uh, offshore. We are more near shore oriented. So we go on small vessels. And yeah, it's an uh, important skill to know how to fix stuff when stuff breaks. And you can, uh, yeah, not waste any time because uh, time is money, of course. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all that matters, but yeah, yeah, not really all for us because for us, it's also fun to do it. Uh, we just uh, enjoy it. So I know that when I first study, started studying like um, what being on a boat nowadays looks like, my boat vocabulary was like sailboats and then pirate ships. So what, what kind of boat do you work on and where does it fall between that? <laughs> All right, yeah, I work on survey boats. They are specifically designed for survey. So, uh, yeah, it's hard actually, like, it's getting more common to have boats that are specifically designed for that. But sometimes it was, it used to be a fishing boat and it just uh, was um, renovated, yeah, fitted for a purpose. So you make holes in places uh, where you want to put your instruments and you make uh, things to attach it to because we have this uh, kind of echo sounders um, or yeah, other machines that we have to lower into the into the sea because 
if you put it on the boat, the boat has so much noise. It's literally like really, really noisy on a boat. So we have to put it down as far as possible from the boat. So it doesn't bother all of our measurements because our measurements are, li are literally noise. That's what we measure. And then we interpret it into depth measurements or yeah, image, images and things like that. But uh, literally we, we are just yelling at them at the seafloor and hearing what it says back. And then we <laughs> interpret it. And yeah, and then we make maps and images and pictures and stuff. That's... That you can associate with, uh, yeah, you can uh, just, it looks like the, uh, if you look at, a, at an image from the seafloor, it looks just like maybe mountains or sea or dunes or whatever, but literally it's just points with measurements and we made that. So <laughs> cool. And then, so what yeah. do you use this data for? Like who, who is saying, hey, I want these maps of the seafloor and what can that be applied to? There are different clients and different industries that uh, want this data. One industry that is very important, but we don't work with them, is the oil industry, because they have all sorts of installations on the seafloor and they need data all the time for that since the, before they even start doing something until they are actually doing it and after they did it also. So they need a lot of data. But yeah, we don't work with that uh, in that company. We work more with uh, offshore wind farms. That's a, a big, big thing now at the moment. And the North Sea is really crowded with wind farms. It is like, I don't know, it's, you cannot imagine it's the sea, but underneath it or like even on top because it's wind turbines are everywhere. It's really busy. It's like a, yeah, it's just like a construction site, a huge one. And we need to monitor the installations all the time and before they are installed, while they're being installed and after they're installed every year or so, we have to survey the installations to make sure that it's not eroding. So it's not that it's stable. It's not going to, yeah, it's very dynamic. Uh, it's changing all the time. So you have to uh, make sure that it's still on place, not that it's going to fall. And yeah, then it's a big deal. <laughs> Got it. But, oh, wind for yeah, farms, I, wind farms like um, in terms of natural energy, um, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, there is like a different uh, sectors also because there is also the companies that are installing the cables to the wind farm. They also need data through like a route, sometimes a hundred kilometer where they have to put this cable. And this is all the time. This can take like one year, two years, and we are always um, providing data. Sometimes they are using the data like at the time. I have to be on a boat and map something, what they are doing, and give to the guys on the other vessel, which is a bigger vessel that is actually doing the job. And they immediately use those, that data for, their, um, for what they're doing. So that's also a cool thing to do. So like, there's no fancy maps or anything. It's just data going, I take it, I make data and I give it to them and they just use it like right away. And you feel it like the hurry and they're like, hey, please, can you send it? Can you send it? We need it, we need it. And yeah, sometimes it's a lot of pressure, but uh, it's also fun and uh, pleasant or like, yeah pleasing to deliver those things cool. it's like you feel that you're part of something yeah yeah you get yeah. like that instant gratification of seeing your work being applied that's really neat yeah. yeah but sometimes it's also just like the government wants this data to make um, navigational charts nautical charts from yeah from the beach or near the beach i hear there is a lot of coastal protection projects because of yeah the netherlands is under um, below the sea the sea, sea level so it's a constant uh, risk of flooding so they they have a lot of uh, just monitoring of the morphology of the coast make sure that it's not eroding and things like that so that they can protect it so that that also is a, a sector an industry would say one of our clients actually <laughs> we do a lot for the Dutch government here oh, it's cool. really cool it's a uh, really really great yeah it's um, a good client so you mostly uh work and travel um sort of around the netherlands shores have you branched out uh to any other locations or is do you mostly stay local then yeah uh, netherlands uk germany denmark so I would say like mostly North Sea, but my, my company has some projects overseas, like in Taiwan and uh, in the Caribbean, in Africa also. But yeah, I mostly stick around Europe. For me, it's easier because of my visa also requirements. Like I am, yeah, I'm not an European, so it's harder to just go somewhere 
and uh, work there. But here I have, yeah, I'm allowed to work here, so. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, so, but I wouldn't mind going to the Caribbean for a project. That would uh, that wouldn't be bad, <laughs> right? <laughs> Me too. Although it sounds like your line of work is more likely to take you there than mine. <laughs> yeah, you never know. I don't know. It's also you are also are full of possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> How long are you on a boat without coming to shore? Like, are, do you spend nights on the boat as well, or do you, because you work close to the shore, do you come back in? Yeah, if I, if we go on the, it could be both. Like, uh, I mean, not at the same time, but uh, we I, we do both. It's either on a small vessel, which is just you and the and the skipper, or maybe a few colleagues, but it's very small and there is no accommodation, so we just come back to port every night. But sometimes we stay on a bigger vessel and then we stay offshore. We are like also further offshore, deeper water also, and doing a, a little bit different kind of jobs. And yeah, we stay there 24 hours operations usually. So we just uh, sleep on the vessel. Oh, cool. And are those in yeah. like, are those in like, um, ca like cabins? Like now I'm picturing like cruise ship cabins, but <laughs> you know, I don't know how big this vessel is. Yeah. Well, yeah, it can be normally it's, yeah, not like a cruise ship uh, cabin. It can be very small, like uh, just a place for a bed. I, I, I had once just a bunk bed and like, I don't know, maybe one meter to the side, and that was it. And uh, yeah, I had to share this with my colleague, which was the opposite shift. So if he if he's off shift, then he can use the cabin um, because I'm out. But uh, also sometimes it's a, a little bit bigger, not so much bigger, <laughs> maybe double the size of this. And you can have also your own toilet inside of the room. It depends on the size of the vessel. The last one I was on, the big one, it had even a sauna on the vessels. It was like really, really fancy. But yeah, most of the times we're not staying on that fancy. We are also, it's like being a survey, a survey, the survey is like a very important part of a big project. That's also one of the first things I uh, learned in the company. Like it's a very, a lot of other parts of the project depends on the survey, but it's a very cheap part also and they don't pay much and and we are yeah we need to be small to go on the awkward places like you want to go shallow you want to go in uh, I don't know corners so you want smaller vessels so the smaller the better actually but yeah if we're sure then mm -hmm. uh, it's different <laughs> yeah what's the strangest or craziest thing that's happened while you're on the boat I mean you mentioned like some technical things can break down um, but I don't know, have you made any like discoveries like, oh, that's weird or, you know, I just imagine yelling at the ocean floor, <laughs> you might get some strange things yelling back at you. Yeah, I don't know. I think that we have strange things happening at all the time, but I just get used to them so much that I cannot like pinpoint one now. It's like <laughs> every time it's some crap happening. Like last time we had this big uh, frame, just like last project that I did. And it was my first time working with this thing. It was a magnetometer. So we are actually measuring the uh, mag magnetics of the materials because we are looking for bombs, for like the Second World War bombs that might be in the construction site. Oh, they wow. need to be removed. Yeah, they need to. That's a very common survey that we do. Like it's one of our specialities. Uh, these bombs need to be removed before any project starts, so they hire us to just uh, search for them. And the way we do that, we just have magnetometers measuring, yeah, the magnetic field. And when there is an anomaly, then there's probably a target, so they go investigate them with a camera on those targets. But yeah, to do this with these magnetometers, we have a frame, like a big one, where we can put six magnetometers together, one next to each other. It's a very big thing. And there are motors on it. We, we developed it in-house and um, we can control it. So it's a remotely operated or remotely towed ve vehicle that we can control with a, a computer software. And yeah, the principle is really nice, but uh, like this is a very big, heavy thing and you put it in the water. Normally we don't have very good weather here and we don't want to wait so much for it because yeah, it's a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> so because it doesn't come, it is winter in yeah in the North Sea or uh, yeah in, in in Europe. So what can you expect? <laughs> but yeah, we put it in the water anyway, and then the whole thing flipped around, like 
in the water by itself and uh, we have no idea what what do we do now to like flip it back so just try to put it back in the water flip it back because it is so big you cannot just flip it like you cannot just put it on board of the vessel and do it like uh, it needs to be done by itself but yeah i don't know it was just completely crazy and you have this big coming big thing coming up and down and up and down and flipping in the in the ocean and like um, terrible weather happening too <laughs> yeah yeah and like i have no idea and then later on we had to replace one of the motors from it like a thousand uh, bolts and screws i'm also not like really good at it you know like i am i was an academic i studied the like that's also one of the challenges for me like just to know how to use the tools and on a moving vessel you know if bad weather sometimes the clients are there like this time i had two clients looking at us what are we doing how are we doing it <laughs> well, that's when you bring pain? in the car mechanic <laughs> to be like all <laughs> right i got the wrench <laughs> yeah yeah but he's not he's not always there but yeah like we have to kind of be all all of us have to be some sort of mechanics like we just take our tools and and do it like uh, we just do it even if we do it weird, like uh, sometimes it's duct tape everywhere, you know, like it's high ribs and uh, yeah, but we just make it work. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that that all problem solving just eventually comes down to planned duct tape. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Duct tape is an important material, <laughs> essential. <laughs> so how many people are usually on, um, on a ship or a team at a time? Oh, depends. <laughs> it can be just you and two, like you and another uh, person that is a pilot in the boat, or it can be, I don't know, a hundred people in a project. Yeah, it's because of the, if you have a big vessel, then they have a lot of crew also just to maintain the vessel and the things in the vessel. So like, yeah, maybe 50, like less, this was a big vessel and there was 50 crew members already. So like, just to keep everything going because the vessel is so big. And then like 20 project members. So you have quite quite a few people in the in the project in the vessel. But yeah, when it comes down to the job, like all you need is one, uh, yeah, if it's if it's just making maps, like just that, then you just need two. <laughs> <laughs> and then the more things you want, because it's sometimes it's just yeah, how complicated are those maps and what you are looking for, and you need to use other techniques and more instruments, and it's getting like dang more dangerous and then you need more people but yeah it's oh, okay. our job is very small compared to the rest like it's, if we some if we are on a ve big vessel it's not just us like then there are other things going on as well it's like a big group doing different things so yeah then it's different <laughs> any consideration um that you have to take for wildlife while you're doing this because yeah. if you're dropping equipment in, I imagine there are some kinds of communities down there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the ones that uh, mind us the most are the mammals or like the dolphins and whales because they use the same methods for their positioning in the water and communication. So they're also kind of having their own biological sonars and they are um, yelling at each other, at the seafloor, they, they, that's, that's how they know how deep they are or yeah, how they have to go, uh, how far they have to go to the, to get air and uh, they can see each other or they communicate with each other. But uh, they say, the researchers, that some of our frequencies that we use are the same as what they use. So then it's interfering or causing them confusion and problems. So yeah. And some projects you have, you need to have a guy there that is just uh, observing to see if they, uh, if he sees any mammals, because you can see them because they just go all the time uh, to get air. So you, dolphins and whales, you can see. So if they see, these are just in big uh, projects, uh, seismic, uh, like with us, almost never. Um, then if they see, you have to stop it or you have to, yeah, there's not much that you can do actually. Like you just should not bother them so much, but sometimes we just take uh, also this uh, we just do it you know like uh, sometimes we are in a nature nature reserve mm. and uh, it's not allowed to do this there because it bothers the animals but if you need to install a cable to the offshore wind farm then they give an exception for you to during that period of time you can bother them 
and uh, yeah so like we are aware that they are there and we know that we bother them but in the end of the day when the when they want the job done they get the job done and uh, well i imagine that some of the uh the problems are mutual then because if you're saying they're at the same frequencies then probably their communication would mess with your equipment right yeah but uh, we have we have all kinds of noises that affect our equipment but we filter it and we fix it uh, also later on um <laughs> so it doesn't really bother us that much sometimes they appear in our uh, map they can uh, just be on the data that's uh, fun <laughs> oh, i never cool. seen it myself but i had a colleague that showed me a picture of a perfect whale like uh, on the seafloor from yeah from the measurements she just she just swim there while they were measuring it so <laughs> cool so there's some like imaging too it's not just data yeah we see it uh, like uh, immediately we have it's all interfaced in the computers in like a lot of computers actually we have like sometimes eight screens you know <laughs> six to eight screens for sure are on and um all this data is already being interpreted by the computer and turns like in kind of uh, live maps. So like you were sailing it, sometimes you feel like uh, you have a brush and you have to paint this part of the seafloor with the data. And you just go with the boat and in the computer you can see already where you've passed, you can see like already a stretch of map being made. And, and then we fill in a box or whatever and you can see the things coming like immediately. And if there is noise, then you will see some weird things. But then in the office later on, the processors are going to uh, yeah, take the noise out and just make it uh, good. So immediately you can see something, but you, you see if there is noise or if there is problems with the data, you, yeah, you also see it and then you can uh, try to fix it because sometimes you can uh, see a problem that you have maybe something is, uh, is wrong with with the equipment, you know, like there are so many equipment <laughs> and they all need to be in sync and they all need to be working perfectly fine. So that's why you want to see the data immediately because if you do it wrong, they cannot fix it anymore. Like, yeah, if there is noise, if there is some things there that are normal, okay. But uh, if there is something with the positioning or the height, you, it's very important to know the height. This is what we measure and the position where it is, otherwise, is useless you can just throw it out you know if, it's, mm -hmm. if this is wrong ever doesn't matter like what is there it's, it's not possible they need to know exactly where everything is and how high and, and things like that for the to do what they want with that data some other types of survey it's not so obvious like uh, we have we do also sub uh, sub bottom surveys where you want to see the features under the seafloor or what is it like sometimes there's a cable you want to see how deep is the cable so you need something that will actually penetrate the seafloor to see something that it's under. So this is, when you see the data, it's harder. It's just waves and black and white. And uh, yeah, it goes really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes yeah, there's a whale. <laughs> it, is just, it is just weird, uh, strange data. So it's um, not easy to see that even later on when the, the deliverables are made, it's still a little bit weird. So. <laughs> <laughs> Has your job evolved from the time? How long have you been in this position, by the way? Uh, I've been uh, only for three years. Uh, okay. Yeah. So before I was just studying and doing my master's and uh, research, things like that. What degrees do you have? You said you have a master's? Yeah, I have. So I, I studied oceanography for a bachelor's and I have uh, master, uh, a master's in geography and geoinformation science and earth observation. Um, yeah, which is just a methodology to make maps on the computer because that's how we do it nowadays, of course. And have you seen your job evolve from the time that you started three years ago to now? Like, has uh, the method or the equipment you use changed much or has it been essentially the same? Yeah, I think just more and more. Like, uh, it's uh, in the beginning, it was, you start with the simplest, uh, at least in my company, you know, like it's different everywhere but uh, we start just with the easiest uh, method which is a single beam survey it's just uh, one equi equipment that sends one point of data and take it and you make lines of data and uh, yeah we use that to map uh, nautical uh, channels but then you, you start to use the multi beam which is like then making like this uh, real live maps 
and then uh, the magnetometers or sometimes going in bigger so it's like it's just you just start small and within the company and like this small projects that uh, you don't interact so much with the client or anything it's just ourselves and uh, yeah it's easy easier interactions and then you start going more like talking to the client always and uh, being together sometimes you have clients rap with you so it just gets a little bit more respons responsibility. Okay. But I do I do this uh, schedule, which is like four weeks on and four weeks off. And uh, yeah, and it's very nice, but there's also it's these advantages, which is like it limits your development a bit and the speed of your development because you need to fit in the calendar. So it's a little bit hard, like, you know, like my company is very flexible. So things are just happening very quick and they, they want to make a project and then they sign a contract to, this week and next week they want to start and then they it is going like this so it's a bit harder to plan with uh, time that you can be four weeks on a project so sometimes it's, yeah getting a little bit behind on the development but yeah I have time to do a lot of things when I'm off so I like that. <laughs> That's good. I know that you had mentioned um, that <laughs> having that schedule means that you can have a social life, but it kind of has to happen in those four weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. You, I have like two lives, you know, I work and then I have no social life. I don't even sometimes talk to people that are not there. Then, yeah, I have all my social life, life at work. Actually, we are very social. We are always going out and doing things together. Or like now during this year, we rented houses to stay in because it was COVID. So you cannot, uh, we find hotels very depressive during COVID times. So, oh, yeah. So we, just rent, we just rent houses and stay there. Like for us, it's okay because we have to be on a small vessel anyway together. So it is like the same household. And we just keep the, yeah, cooking for ourselves and uh, drinking beer together in the evening. You know, maybe watch a movie or something, just like a little family and that it's, sounds it's cool. great. Yeah, it sounds great yeah. if you like if you like everybody there. I can imagine if there are some issues, it would it would get pretty volatile pretty fast. Yeah, that is true. That is actually a thing, and it is an important thing. It needs to be good. The atmosphere is very important. It needs to be good. And uh, yeah, I've been told already by my manager that if there is a problem of bad atmosphere on the vessel, you have to report this immediately, and we have to take action as soon as possible. Like. Oh, this that's a good important. Rule. Yeah, it is like it is so important because if if, there, if it's bad, people are just going to not work well and uh, maybe make mistakes. It can even get like, leads to unsafe situations. So it is just uh, we have to be nice to each other and take care of each other. But yeah, this is also you know within my company it's almost no problem because it's everybody's super nice like yeah everybody's a character like uh, not one person is kind of boring or unpolite like yeah it's just everybody's very unique and I think it's one of the reasons why they hire us they just want to have we just want to be like unique every everyone yeah so, yeah <laughs> it's cool. our are most people um local yeah I used to be uh, more Dutch uh, but uh, we are now taking over <laughs> like uh, there are a lot of French people also and mostly Europeans there is quite a few uh, Polish people uh, yeah British people but, uh, from outside Europe there is just me from Brazil and uh, another guy from India the rest are Europeans it's a bit easier to hire Europeans you know like uh, there is not all the visa complications and stuff so <laughs> when did you um move from Brazil to the Netherlands and why did you decide to go there? Was that because of the job? Uh, no, <clears throat> I just, uh, when I finished my studies uh, oceanography, I wanted to do a master's abroad. Uh, or yeah, I also wanted to do it in Rio de Janeiro because why not? <laughs> but uh, it was the end of my graduation and I need to finish my uh, bachelor thesis, which was like quite long in the end. And there were other problems with my house and uh, things like that I just yeah I just wanted to have something to do next and the industry was going bad because I was then kind of being trained for working in the oil industry mm -hmm. but there was the oil big oil crisis at the time it was around 2015 and like there were no jobs everybody was getting fired so I was like yeah okay I go for master's and where do I go so it was so late in the year that there was not that many um like uh, it's not possible to apply to that many uh, programs because they were already closed, the application. So I found that one. It was Erasmus Mundus and uh, one year in the Netherlands and one year in Iceland. 
Oh, wow. And I always wanted to go to Iceland. Like, I've been there for a trip, but I wanted to... Yeah, I was really in love with Iceland. It's, like, amazing. So, kind of because of that, because with that program, I could go to Iceland, mm -hmm. that I chose to come here. So, <laughs> Are there any misconceptions about what you do? Like, when you tell people what you do, are there any assumptions that they make that you have to correct all the time? Yes, definitely. All the time, they think I am a marine biologist, <laughs> which is a complete <laughs> different uh, profession and, like, like, definitely has nothing to do with it. But <laughs> especially if I say I'm an oceanographer, they always think I am a marine biologist, like that I dive and that I swim with whales and with sea right. turtles. And I'm just like, no, I have these machines and I sit behind a computer screen the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, at least, you know, besides of the time when I'm actually outside deploying the machines. But yeah, it is just uh, always, always. But if I say I'm a surveyor, then they don't know what I'm talking about. They have no idea. And then I have to explain that, uh, yeah, I just always say we make maps because it's the easiest. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it can be a little bit more than that. Like sometimes you're searching for things or just positioning things. Yeah. What kind of things are you searching for? Oh, besides like the World War II bombs. Like, are you ever searching maybe for ship shipwrecks? shipwrecks? Yeah, oh, okay. shipwrecks. Or uh, like last year or two years ago, actually, there was uh, an accident uh, with a big uh, container vessel and they dropped 300 containers on a nature reserve area here in the Netherlands. So we needed to search for those containers everywhere. Like, and we just like uh, looking for containers for six months, I think. <laughs> you find them all? <laughs> no, not all, but we found a lot of them and also a lot of other things, including shipwrecks, which were not mapped before because it was just like everywhere we were mapping. So that was great, actually. Great project. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. You're making all these discoveries while looking for containers. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. It's, it's fun. <laughs> can be fun unrelated well kind of related have you ever seen a narwhal i am like obsessed with narwhals and you can't see them in captivity but i know that there are narwhals like up north some people like <laughs> think that they're like unicorns that they're fake but i'm like no <laughs> narwhals are real and they're so cool and i want to see one so bad <laughs> it's a unicorn whale yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> yeah i would love to see one no. yeah i don't see many of the fun animals actually this is like really disappointing and mm. I see a lot of crabs and ugly fish. It's very <laughs> uh, boring. Uh, yeah. Is that because in Brazil, of... if I was in the ship in Brazil, then there's always whales and, and, and dolphins and stuff. But here it's just like, oh, one thing we see that is nice is seals. There's a oh, lot of seals. Oh, you do see seals. Oh, yeah, cool. a lot. A lot. And they are always chilling on the beach. Oh, like a lot of them. <laughs> oh, that's really fun. <laughs> They're just kind of shameless. <laughs> Sometimes you go very close to them and they're just like laying there and then they look at us and then slowly start, okay, I go now. But they, we can go very close to them, like a That's... couple of meters. <laughs> they're, the like, they're like the big ones, like the circus seal type? Yes, they're very fat, very fat. <laughs> <laughs> the fat seals. Yeah. <laughs> So funny. Well, I think I've run through about all of my questions. Uh, before we wrap up, is there anything else you want to say to um, the audience about your job? Or if not, that's totally fine too. I feel like we talked about a lot of really cool stuff. So. Yeah, no, yeah, I think so too that we talked a lot and uh, I think that's enough. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe if it's, if it's getting too romantic, it shouldn't be too romantic, you know, like it is a hard job. Sometimes like, uh, yeah, we, we are working long hours and in the night, in the cold weather and the very weird, awkward situations. Yes, all the time. But yeah, we have fun. That's important. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you have fun. Well, thank you so yeah. much for talking with me. This has been wonderful. I loved hearing about your job, like all parts of it, the romantic and the not romantic parts. So, <laughs> this yeah, really yeah. good. That's so, cool. Uh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for talking to me. It was cool. And uh, I'm looking forward to see your project uh, done when it's uh, done. Thank you again so much and have yeah. a great evening. You too. Bye and uh, happy Christmas. <laughs> yeah, happy Christmas. Yeah, bye.
Thank you all so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Please let me know in the comments below if there are other people you would like me to interview, other subjects you would like me to talk about. I know a lot of you really enjoyed that video game video I did and I really enjoyed making it. So a part, so a part two is definitely coming up of that. In the meantime, please check out the other stuff that MOC has on our channel and I'll see you all again soon. Bye.